<coughs> thereby. Now, the difference between the linguistic case and more simply visual cases um, is that the um, that in the fish sentence, the conceptual assignments are not made on the basis of resemblance. The word fish no, does not resemble a fish in any way, nor does, does it resemble the activity of fishing. Um, and indeed, uh, the words in the sentence are not differentiated from one another by any strictly visual or auditory marks. Uh, you could you can take those words, those five occurrences of fish and jumble them up and, and, and do, the, do the very same thing uh, with them um, regardless of, well, I mean, the, the order makes no difference because they're all the same word. Um, but there's a limit to what we can do, just as, just as there was a limit in the case of the, um, uh, the duck rabbit. We can't see it as a bowl of gerberas. Here, if we try to make this set of assignments to the sentence, I, I don't think we can do it. Uh, at least I can't do it. I can't make any sense of the, of, a, of the fish sentence with this set of role assignments. So it looks to me as though there's a limit there. The limit is probably given by the, by English, the English language. <laughs> by the fact that um, about word order in, in English or something like that. Paraphrasing, we'd get something like catch, catch, fish, 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 which to me doesn't mean anything at all. Um, it, might, it might mean something fine in a, in a highly inflected language, you, but, you, but that, then you wouldn't have anything like the fish sense, right? It would be uh, if it were inflected. Um, So, uh, and so what, what we're unable to do here, it seems to me, is make sense of it, right? In, we can't make sense of it in this order. We, don't, we can't understand it. We, we can't bring it into, a, into focus as a perceptual whole. Um, so now here's a distinction. Perhaps we can see even better the point about perception by imagining somebody who can't hear the fish sentence as a sentence but by some method of calculation and inference can figure out the grammatical assignments of the word tokens. Beginning students in Greek, uh, when construing a sentence for a teacher, they use the word construe for that too, sometimes uh, figure out the grammar and vocabulary of a Greek sentence in this way. They look, look up the words in a dictionary and they look up the uh, endings in, a, in a, an inflection chart and, um, and then they get it right let's say, they, you know, they, they construe the, the sentence right in that sense. But I want to say they're not construing it in the sense that I'm talking about. They're not hearing that as a meaningful sentence. And, um, and I think also there's something very defective about their understanding, right? They don't, they don't understand the sentence either, in a sense. They, they can make the right, the right role assignments to the items in the sentence, but they, they don't understand it if they can't hear it as a sentence. Or at least, I want to say, there's some kind of, there's some understanding that they're missing, right? Maybe they understand it in some, some minimal sense. So construal in this sense is a kind of perception, an impression <clears throat> that results from a power of the mind to synthesize div diverse parts of something that works as a whole into an impression of the whole that it works as. Here, perceptual organization differs, pure, differs from purely intellectual or calculating organization. So there's a strong analogy between the ability to see the duck rabbit as a rabbit or a duck and the ability to hear the fish sentence as a, as a sentence. An inability of either kind is both a failure of understanding and a failure of perception in the broad sense that I'm proposing. In each case, the person who construes the object in a sense-making way undergoes a phenomenal presentation, a holistic impression as a result of perceptually organizing a body of data. So there are three epistemic payoffs. We've seen them before, um, understanding, acquaintance and justification. Um, I think that those, those um, 
can all be applied to the cases that we've seen. So let's talk about emotions, finally. Let me just check to see what time I have. Okay. Um, on the view of emotions that I'm uh, going to uh, propose, they are construals of a sort, um, but they're a particular kind, namely concern-based construals. There's, there's an element here that's not present in the other, uh, in the controls that we've seen so far. So their perceptions, in the construal sense of the word, in which one or more of the elements going into the construal is a concern. I take it that the construals we've been looking at so far are not concern-based or are not emotions. Uh, so, of course, if you're a duck rabbit, a duck lover, and you see this thing that looks like a duck, you might just, your, your heart might palpitate just a little bit, you know? Or if you've got a phobia of, uh, of ducks, and you see this thing that looks like, suddenly it comes into focus for you as a, as a duck, and you, you panic a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Maybe, okay, if, you're a, if you've got that problem. But of course, then you've got the concern. Some, a concern is, being, is feeding into your construal of the, of the duck. It looks like a threat in the one case. Um, or it looks like a friend in the other case, or something like that. Um, the idea that emotions are concern-based construals, okay, here, yeah, I missed a slide here. Um, yeah, maybe it's worth uh, pausing here for this. Um, so em emotions are perceptions of life situations. The, I the idea I'm going to propose is that life situations have elements in them, too. And uh, what we you do is you, you bring those elements together in a certain sense-making way when you feel an emotion. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, then, and then it has to be on the basis of a, of a, a concern. So seeing something as in danger uh, becomes affective when I see it as something I care about. I can see something as in danger, but without caring about it. In that case, I don't have an emotion about it. And then the, the idea is that they come also in types. So anger, fear, envy, joy, hope, gratitude, shame. It's, it's really a striking fact about human languages that we all have this vocabulary for emotion types. Uh, we don't have a very rich vocabulary for desire types or belief types or something, but we do have, have it for emotion types. Very standard things. So if, I, if, I, if somebody tells me uh, he's angry, I know, the kind of, I know the kind of way he's seeing the situation, right? And it's different from envy, and it's different from jealousy, and it's different from hope, and so forth. Um, Okay, so here's a kind of basic schema for an emotion that has motivation. Uh, you, you come into the situation uh, with a concern. Uh, that's the, on the left. You, uh, you enter the situation, and the concern might be an active concern, an, an occurrent or con a concern, or it might be a completely dispositional concern. You might not be thinking anything about what you're, what, what you're going to encounter in the situation. And then you go into the situation, and uh, because you do have this dispositional concern, that concern is triggered by the way you see, this, see the situation. So um, we've got an example here uh, that the ch my child is, um, I, I look up, not thinking about uh, anything particular, not thinking about how much I love my child or anything, but I, 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 I look up, and there the kid is is just right on the edge of a three-foot wall. He's, he's walking along the top of this wall, this two-year-old, this uh, toddler. And I, and I, I'm, I have, have an episode of fear, right? Um, the, the episode of fear is a combination, is the, is the, is the, uh, the, the synthesis of the integration of, these, of this concern that I've got for the child. And, the, and seeing him in a situation that presents a danger to him. So I care about the child. I see the wall, the, his nearness to the wall as a, 
as a threat uh, to him, and I have fear, a fear episode. Um, and that fear episode is going to uh, very likely result in, an, in a desire. I'm going to want something as a result of that. And it'll be something in the neighborhood of you know, keeping the kid from the danger, preventing, avoiding the, uh, the threat, uh, defusing the threat. And so I might uh, want to uh, alert somebody to, uh, to, to grab the kid for me. Or I might jump up and grab the kid myself. Or I might yell at the kid and say, come here. <laughs> or something like this. But I, I, I have a, an inclination to do something. I have a motivation that comes out of that fear. Um, So each type of emotion, then, uh, I'm going to say, has a set of sort of, a, it's, it's a little package of concepts in terms of which you see the elements in the situation. So in the, in the fear case, you see the near, nearness to the wall as a threat. You see the child as the, as the, as the why, the one on whose behalf you're afraid. Um, you, uh, you see... Uh, Preventing the child's falling as the, the, the good thing that needs to be done, and so forth. Um, so there's a little package of concepts. Threat is, the, I think, the central one for fear, but it's threat to well-being of something. And then there's the thing threatened, and then there's the, the avoidance of the pro or protection, uh, the avoidance of the, of the threat or protection of the thing um, on behalf of who, which you're afraid. And, uh, and so, so your, your construal of the situation, you see the situation and you, you pull it together in this meaningful way, right? It has a certain kind of meaning because you're assigning roles to these elements uh, in this, and you're assigning them in the way characteristic of fear.